Um, and now I'd like to introduce our plenary speaker, um, Sam Popovich, who um, has come to us from the University of, of Alberta, where he is a Discovery Systems Librarian. Um, he has a BA in History from the University of Manitoba, an MLIS from Dalhousie, and an MA in Musicology from Carleton University. Prior to working at the University of Alberta, he was the Emerging Technologies Librarian at the U University of Ottawa. At both university, universities, he has been responsible for implementing library discovery systems and other technology services. He has experience with PHP, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, XML, uh, Java, and Ruby, and he is an avid mandolin player. Um, over the past several years, Sam has become interested in computer programming as a faculty librarian skill, and he has participated in software carpet carpentry and ladies learning code workshops, and was heavily involved in the switch to Ruby as the primary programming language for the University of Alberta's Information Technology Services and Digital, digital Initiatives groups. He has been interested in and has worked with open source software and communities since the mid 1990s, and he's active on Twitter as at Red Library. Thanks, Paulina. All right. Um, I think Paulina asked me to be here to sort of represent the library side of things. And it's been really interesting over the last couple of days to listen to the sessions and the conversations that are going on because. We're doing the same work. I think librarians maybe approach it from a slightly different angle. Um, and there's a debate that, that sort of keeps coming up. It's like a, a librarian, technology librarian cocktail party topic about <laughs> whether what librarians do constitutes digital humanities work or whether it simply supports the, the work that digital humanities researchers and scholars do. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. that. That can go on all day. Um, what I do want to talk about um, is the fact that over the last few years, uh, the topic of technological or digital literacy has come to the fore in librarianship. Uh, in public library systems where this is most common, this is usually understood um, partly as an extension of the provision of personal computer and internet training, um, which began in the mid-90s, and partly as an adoption by libraries, again, mostly public, of maker and hacker culture. From the public library perspective, digital literacy support tends to take the form of training, assistance, equipment, and space. Maker spaces are a growing element of library spaces uh, and the provision of digital services um, to users. On the staff side, the question of digital literacy is often focused on whether librarians should learn to code. Maker spaces and coding for librarians are two major focal points of debates around social class, gender, and race in libraries, contested through the lens of privilege and diversity. On the one hand, some argue that makerspaces and coding have visible practical benefits independent of social, cultural, and political issues. Uh, learning and teaching new skills, making space and equipment available to all is seen as leveling. On the other hand, privileging making coding can be interpreted as perpetuating race, class, and gender dominance in fields like librarianship and technology that have not yet solved, and in some cases not even recognized, their race, class, and gender problem. We can't divorce programming as a skill or a practice from its social, cultural, and political context, but at the same time, it's a valuable skill in the information and software-driven society of the 21st century. The recognition of its importance and of the ubiquity of technology in general tends to fall into two camps, a dystopian technological determinism and a kind of utopian humanist paradise, both of which drastically oversimplify or even ignore the complexity at issue. Is it possible to adopt coding as a skill without subscribing either to determinist or utopian ideologies? Might we look at things dialectically and discover a third term, which might allow us to open up a space of resistance to the patterns of domination in which coding is embedded, without closing our eyes to the limitations and structural inequalities of that space? Might we think about learning to code as part of a critical liberation pedagogy as outlined by Paulo Freire? Now, I'm not qualified really to speak about issues of race and gender. Um, I'm the typical technology librarian. But I acknowledge that race and gender problems exist at the exact conjunction of the two fields that I participate in professionally. Um, and there are a lot of other people who are better qualified to talk about the experience of gender and racial discrimination in this area. People like Andromeda Yelton, Cecily Walker, Chris Burg, Bess Sadler, and others. 
What I'm interested in speaking about today is the question of agency or social class within the structures of early 21st century information work. In many ways, the work of the 21st century is simply the continuation of the mechanization and systematization of the work that was done in the 19th and 20th centuries. We live in the age of software, of the software and, software and computer engineer and of hyper-tailorism in everything that can't be engineered away. A good example of which are the disclosures uh, that have come out of Amazon over the last year or two and especially in the last week. The scientific engineering utopian worldview with its assumptions of reason and meritocracy, the privileging of scientific truth and promise of salvation, lies behind many of the cultural struggles we see today. And in many ways, the rise of geek culture is a symptom of this. Engineering seems to offer a pragmatic route out of the quagmires of essentialism, argument and subjectivity that are unavoidable but interesting, though messy, components of the human experience. We might resist the totalizing impulse of engineering, but we can't avoid it. I'd like to talk a little bit about how, as humanists, we might use the quintessential engineering skill of computer programming to further humanist projects, support humanist inquiry, and contribute to humanist pedagogy. Many people have written on the dichotomy between what I'm going to call engineering and humanism. Karl Marx spoke of the tendency of capitalism to replace human labor by machinery in the mistaken belief that inefficient human labor is a limit on profit. And Horkheimer and Adorno addressed the consequences of a privileging of the Enlightenment's instrumental reason. David West, in his 2004 book on object-oriented design and programming, uh, object thinking, calls the two terms of this dichotomy formalism and hermeneutics, and defines the distinction as one between rationalism and determinism on the one hand, arising from the work of Descartes and Leibniz, and on the other hand, emergence, relationality, and interpretation. In West's view, the two approaches can be exemplified in computer science in the debates around artificial intelligence that arose in the 1970s. Formalist AI, which was based on a symbolic theory of cognition, saw intelligence as deterministic, while those who advanced a hermeneutic position saw intelligence as behavioral and emergent. Closer to home, in The Humanist as Reader, Anthony Grafton describes the differences between the practices of medieval and Renaissance readers. Grafton compares the work of the medieval scholastic to that of builders, and he writes, by decades of hard work with hammer and chisel, they fashioned a complex Gothic set of walls, of walls and buttresses, which preceded, surrounded, and supported the texts, headings, commentaries, and separate treatises. This apparatus succeeded in imposing a medieval outlook on the most disparate ancient texts. The humanists, in reaction to the over-engineering of the scholastics, rescued these classic texts by stripping them of their medieval accretions, looking for an unmediated engagement with the text. Quoting Grafton again, the medieval texts were laid out in two columns and written in a spiky, formal Gothic script. They occupied a relatively small space in the center of a large page, and they were surrounded on that page by a thick hedge of official commentary written in a still smaller, still less inviting script. Such books naturally repelled Renaissance scholars to whom they seemed a visual as well as an intellectual distortion of their own content. New designs for books, scripts, and libraries replaced the old medieval versions and allowed reading to escape from the confines of medieval authority, both intellectually and physically. The pocket-sized editions of Minutius and others printed in the new humanist hand allowed people like Machiavelli to colonize new spaces of reading, spaces other than libraries, scriptoria, or private studies. Grafton opens his essay with, an, with a letter from Machiavelli describing the variety of his reading, of his reading practice, taking different books uh, into his study than into the woods. Such informal reading was impossible with medieval books. To my mind, this distinction between the over-engineered medieval approach to texts and the unmediated inquiring approach of the humanists is apparent in many different disciplines. My academic background is cultural musicology, and one of the areas of debate in the field is around performance technique. A distinction is drawn between the formalist engineer technique of the conservatories and the relational emergent technique learned in jazz clubs or on the streets of Rio. John Williams, one of the main exponents along with Julian Bream of the post-Segovia classical guitar, is often acclaimed for his perfect tone and technique and at the same time criticized for his lack of emotion and robotic playing. His renditions of Bach and Barrios allow the listener to hear every note, even at high speed, and in some ways it could be argued that Williams gets out of the way of the music. But criticism is leveled at his lack of humanism, of the, the over-engineered sound. Compared to Williams, the jazz guitarist Lenny Bro and the samba guitarist Baden Powell sound sloppy with imperfect technique. Comparing a well-known piece of Bach's played by all three guitarists exposes their different styles and approaches. 
On the one hand, Williams' performance is engineered to be perfect, repeatable. The outcome is predetermined. For Bro and Baden-Powell, on the other hand, the performance is extemporized, exploratory, and open. There's nothing inherently wrong with either of these approaches. Williams' recordings of Bach and Barrios have been an important part of many guitarists' music, musical experience. But there is something in Bro and Baden-Powell that resists, in a ragged way, the, in the instrumental logic of capitalism. Their music seems to repay repeated interrogation and investigation in a way that Williams's does not. I've introduced these examples of engineering versus humanism in order to raise the question of employing typically engineering practices in the humanist disciplines. In a recent talk, Avdi Urim, a well-known figure in the Ruby programming community, approached this topic from the other direction. Speaking to engineers at the Tropical Ruby Conference in Brazil earlier this year, Grimm argued that the Ruby community is well-placed to provide an end run around the formalist school, a space where informal hermeneutic approaches to software development can thrive. The Ruby community, he says, maybe more than any other community, is steeped in, an informalist, agile, steeped in informalist agile practices. The Ruby programming language is an informal language. Ruby doesn't try to tell you how to do things. Its community values conversation and consensus over top-down architecture. And Grimm sums up by saying that in a programming world that pays lip service to object-oriented ideas while still teaching formalist methods, Ruby is a stubborn island of informalism. But why is any of this important? Is this more significant than internecine squabbles within the software development field? I think it is. Uh, the point of Grimm's talk is not that Ruby is the best, most community-driven la language and all other languages are bad, but that if we understand programming languages as representing particular philosophies or worldviews, then the informal behavioral hermeneutic way of describing, understanding, and working with the world that Ruby espouses can be a valid new approach to problems that had previously been understood as purely engineering problems. Understanding the distinction between formalism and hermeneutics, in Grimm's view, opens a space within software development for informal, emergent hermeneutic practices. Much of Grimm's talk draws on West's object thinking, uh, which is an introduction to the philosophy and culture of object-oriented design and programming and of agile software development. Uh, these are the principles of uh, agile software development that were put out um, as a manifesto um, probably 10 or 15 years ago. Both object-oriented programming and agile were developed as methods of resisting traditional monolithic tendencies in software design and development, organizational culture, work processes, collaboration, and team composition. In a nutshell, agile methodologies attempted to create space for more of what we've been calling informal hermeneutic practices. West's thesis that object thinking and agile methodologies can improve both programmers and software is founded on the idea that software development is neither a scientific nor an engineering task. It's an act of reality construction that is political and artistic. Extreme programming, West writes, and to a great extent all of the agile methods represents a new and creative idea about software development. The essence of this new idea might be distilled to a single sentence. Software development is a social activity. For West, agile methodologies are not simply another variety of software engineering, but represent the latest in a long line of challenges to the scientific, formalist, engineering worldview of software development. This is West again. Sharing the goal of software improvement, but rejecting the assumptions implicit in software, in software engineering, several alternative development approaches have been championed. Creativity and art have been suggested as better metaphors than engineering. Software craftsmanship is the current, as of 2004, incarnation of this effort. Now, in order to set object thinking and agile methods up as an alternative to traditional software engineering, West places significant theoretical weight on the dichotomy between formalism and hermeneutics. That this is an oversimplified model should be apparent. Um, the truth is usually more dialectical than that. But I hope that I've shown that there's an intuitive recognition of the at least local validity of thinking in these terms. For West, formalism has its root in the Enlightenment and 20th century successes in science and engineering. And he describes that as, the universe was considered a kind of complicated mechanism that operated according to discoverable laws. Once understood, those laws could be manipulated to bend, to the, human, bend the world to human will. Physicists, chemists, and engineers daily demonstrated the validity of this worldview with consistently more clever and powerful devices. It's useful to contrast this utopian view of rationality with the view expressed in Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, in which they write, 
Interested parties explain the culture industry in technological terms. A technological rationale is the rationale of domination itself. It is the coercive nature of society alienated from itself. Automobiles, bombs, and movies keep the whole thing together until their leveling element shows its strength in the very wrong which it furthered. It has made the technology of the culture industry no more than the achievement of standardization and mass production. This connection might seem tenuous, the theoretical freight too much for West's argument to bear, but Abdi Grimm does make the connection between an informal, humanist, hermeneutic conception of software development and positive social change. Just as software development is a social activity, so the philosophy behind object thinking and agile methodologies is grounded in the possibility of creating a positive culture, of creating a consciousness that might resist centralized control. I don't know if that's big enough. Elements of the hermeneutic humanist culture that, that Grimm identifies are a commitment to disciplined informality rather than defined formality, advocacy of a local rather than a global focus, production of minimum rather than maximum levels of design and process documentation, collaborative rather than an imperial management style, commitment to design based on coordination and cooperation rather than control, rapid prototyping instead of structured development, and valuing the creative over the systematic. I won't go into detail, but um, suffice it to say that the library world exemplifies all of these tensions all the time, um, and I, I assume that that's true within most branches of the academy as well. This is not for reading, this is just a picture. The debate around should librarians learn to code came to the fore recently and was even discussed on Thinks and Burns with Fink and Burn, a local library podcast. In participating in this debate, I came to realize what I think is an important unspoken assumption that those of us who advocate for librarians to learn to program are advocating an engineering approach. The fear is that of totalization, that all librarians, all humanists should learn to code, that coding should be a structural part of LIS education, or that our work will be transformed into a dehumanized engineering job. This fear takes for granted the idea that programming and software engineering are the same thing, and that the engineering approach is the only approach to working with machines and data through code. I believe that the opponents of librarians should learn to code are imputing more value, more weight to that statement than is meant. It's true that as Gillian Byrne points out, librarians should learn to code is an unhelpful shorthand, a slogan obscuring a very complex dynamic. But this does not justify an immediate leap to either all librarians must learn to code or computer science classes should be taught in library schools. There is an alternative, less formal, more hermeneutic approach that I'd like to think through. First of all, I'd like to think about what it means, what we mean by professionalism versus amateurism. Librarianship has a fraught relationship with professionalism. It's a field with, which tends to pride itself on being a profession, while being on the one hand definitely not a profession in the sense that lawyers, doctors, and engineers are, and on the other hand perennially unsure and insecure about its work and its value. Because of this, as well as the challenge of managing extremely complicated information and organizational systems, there's a tendency to try to formalize all of the work that we do in the belief that it'll make our professional status more convincing. This makes some sense. In order to make the case for budgets, for staffing, to be taken seriously in the academy, we need to be able to point to our qualifications and achievements. But I think that this approach can sometimes prevent us from being agile or innovative, makes us slow to change and slow to adopt new techniques and approaches because we require so much formal and professional apparatus to be adopted at the same time. We tend to overthink, over-engineer, and over-professionalize our practices. We find, it hard to, we find it difficult to accommodate and employ soft, subtle, and amateur skills at the same time as we recognize their value. A good example is the processes that surround reference desk interaction. While we recognize the necessity of agility, personality, flexibility, relationship building, etc., we constantly overload reference desk staff with policies, procedures, and documentation. When I speak about librarians learning to program, I mean it in an amateur sense, in the sense that we can be amateur cooks, amateur bike mechanics, amateur musicians, or anything else. I think the informal hermeneutic approach to programming has many benefits for the kind of work librarians and other humanists do. And I don't want to see it smothered under the weight of over-engineered qualification or processes. This kind of amateur approach has only really become available over the last 15 years or so with the advent of lightweight, high-level languages which don't require much infrastructure to run. 
The explosion of web programming and the rapid development of Web 2.0 and semantic web or linked data technologies is due in part to this change as well. Python, which appeared in 1991, PHP, JavaScript, and Ruby, which all appeared in 1995, took programming back from over-engineered languages like C++ and Java and opened it up to amateurs. There had always been amateur programmers, of course, but the combination of these lightweight languages and the web made it easier to write, run, and share code. Today, we see lightweight versions of older esoteric languages like, like Lisp. Clojure, which is a Lisp dialect that runs on the Java virtual machine, appeared in 2007 and provides an alternative way of thinking about code and data from the more mainstream object-oriented paradigm without going back to the over-engineered approaches of C++ and Java. One of the characteristics of languages like Ruby and Python is that they're open source and are both products of and drivers of the explosion in open source activity that we've seen in recent years. Open source and openness in general is part of the informal hermeneutic approach. Formalism or engineering struggles to accommodate the different standards of work, collaboration, documentation, and process that openness represents. This tension can be seen in debates around all sorts of openness, open access publishing, open educational resources, open source software, and open data. As Diane Jakaki mentioned this morning when she was talking about access, there's obviously a class criticism um, around being too self-congratulating around openness. Openness comes with certain educational, leisure time, financial, and access requirements. But this criticism should not make us proponents of closed access, closed data, or proprietary software, which simply plays into the hands of a hermetic class of social engineers. I'm going to quiz everybody on which movies I've taken these screenshots from later. So what do I mean when I say that librarians should learn to code, or any humanists should learn to code? What does this slogan, in fact, obscure? Part of what I mean is that there's a certain level of technological literacy that librarians and humanists need, and that coding is a good way to achieve it. Another aspect is that I think programming is an incredibly useful tool in our increasingly data and software-driven work. But there are many other components to this statement. Many librarians feel exploited by library software vendors, and the quality of closed source library software is generally not high. Learning to program helps us A, to understand software and speak knowledgeably with our vendors, and B, gives us back a measure of control over our own machines to make us less dependent on closed source software and software vendors in the first place. And I think Jeffrey Rockwell's um, point yesterday about knowing how to, or learning how to read software is helped by understanding how software is written. There's also an information literacy component to this. The more we understand about software, the more we can communicate, teach, and share that understanding. Librarianship has always been a technology profession. Software is simply the current foundation of technology. Another benefit to learning to program is the development of computational thinking. Again, this phrase might raise the specter of a totalizing, informal, inf sorry, totalizing formal, inflexible way of thinking. But computational thinking encompasses much more than that. Our technological world runs on computation, but there are many different flavors of computation and a ways of approaching and thinking about a computational problem. Object-oriented languages such as Ruby, model real world or data objects as atomic collections of attributes and behavior, maintaining a separation between data and the code that operates on that data. Functional languages like Clojure, model objects as collections of values, and make no distinction between data and code. Working in each of these languages requires thinking differently about the problem at hand. Do I think that all librarians need to code? No. There are plenty of positions where librarians can probably get by without coding. Do I still think it would be a useful skill? Absolutely. Do I think that librarians need to code as opposed to learning other aspects of information technology like automation, system administration, or use of high-level systems like OpenRefine and Drupal? Again, the answer is no. There are many librarians active in all areas of technology who have gained the qualities and skills I've been talking about without specifically knowing how to program, and who are extremely knowledgeable about software, systems, and information. But do I think learning to code would be useful for them as well? Sure. What then are the practical elements specific to programming that I think are useful for librarians and by extension all humanists? That's impossible to read. In the first place, and perhaps most simply, there are the repetitive tasks that librarians perform on a regular basis that could be automated. And I think in all, in everybody, everyone in the room has work that, that they find could, could, would benefit from automation. Parsing data files, producing reports. Quite often these tasks take a non-trivial amount of time and effort, both of which remain constant no matter how many times the task is repeated. 
Perhaps just as often, the librarian is unable to perform the task themselves and have to put a request into IT where it's assigned a priority and the librarian waits for a response. Being able to program would allow these tasks to be automated and would not require the intervention of IT except potentially for hosting. And for many of the librarians, this kind of work, both behind the scenes and in liaison with faculty, would be the extent of their code use. But that's kind of a trivial example. A more interesting problem is the question of prototyping or domain exploration. A lot of our systems work involves data manipulation, conversion, cleanup, and other kinds of processing. This work cannot be done manually anymore, and so requires software tools to do it. There are two options. You can buy closed source software, or you can write, deploy, or customize your own. Many metadata and cataloging librarians have experience using XSLT to manipulate XML data, and this is one way to approach data, but other programming languages take other approaches, providing flexibility in terms of thinking about modeling and working with the data that we have. Being, being able to quickly and easily explore a data domain or problem, to quickly and easily write simple code that allows you to define and begin working with data without having to satisfy the often over-engineered requirements of IT departments is extremely valuable. This kind of coding as thinking out loud is known in the agile methodology as a spike and is meant to be as informal as possible. It's the equivalent of whiteboarding and just as whiteboarding sometimes leads to a formal solution, sometimes its benefit is purely in quickly and simply framing a problem. Coding allows us to whiteboard directly with data. Knowing how to code also allows us to overcome limitations of open source software solutions. My current project at the University of Alberta is to implement a new search interface and library catalog. And rather than using an unsatisfactory closed source solution, we decided to go with, open source, with an open source project. Open source is, of course, not completely free, and there was a lot of work to be done in order to customize the software to fit our needs, but we could do this work in-house and didn't have to rely, didn't have to outsource or rely on outside developers to implement the requirements of our domain experts, st our students, faculty, and other librarians. These are some immediate practical benefits to learning how to code, but there are other less tangible benefits. One of the characteristics of capitalism is alienation from the product of labor. Building software gives a measure of agency and investment back to workers. This feeling is fleeting and maybe even delusional, but it feels real. Amateur learning itself can, in my view, provide a feeling of resistance to the instrumental logic of training and education that we're all embedded in. Passing along the appreciation of amateurism through less formal training programs like Ladies Learning Code or Software Carpentry, or through very informal mechanisms like pair programming sessions and hackfests, can also, I think, open up a space for anti-instrumental and anti-totalizing approaches to technology. How might this space actually be opened up? In his 2011 book, Representing Capital, Frederick Jameson raises an important question about technology. Is it cause or effect, he writes, the creature of human agency or the latter's master, an extension of collective power or the latter's appropriation? Two attempts at answering this question, in Jameson's view, can be found in technological determinism and the kind of humanist paradise I began this talk by mentioning. But Jameson goes on to say that neither outcome is conceptually or ideologically satisfying. Both are recurring and plausible interpretations of Marx, and each seems incompatible with the other. Perhaps the union of opposites offers a more productive view of what in Marx is staged as an alternation. A phenomenon like capitalism is good and bad all at once simultaneously the most productive as well as the most destructive force we have so far encountered in human history, as the manifesto puts it. The class, gender, and race critiques of technology, technological determinism, and a gleeful, unquestioning rush to the latest technologies are all valid. At the same time, the possibilities for sharing, collaboration, agency, investment, and commitment to work, the possibilities of overcoming alienation, however briefly and however in the end fruitlessly, all of these are part of becoming more involved in the technological landscape of our professions. Is coding the only way of becoming more involved? No. But I feel it has the lowest barrier and a very high rate of return. What does all this have to do with pedagogy? If we follow Freire and define praxis as reflection and action directed at the structures to be transformed, then learning to code or teaching to code is important in a number of respects. In terms of the structures to be transformed, there is, on the one hand, the structure of private property, challenged by participation in cultures of openness, sharing, and collaboration that comes with writing code and engaging in open source projects. 
Then there are the structures of gender, race, and class dominance that have traditionally been part of the culture of software engineering, even when that tradition is in fact, in fact incorrect. Um, I included Ada Lovelace and Esther Gerson and Gloria Gordon here um, because the role of women in the first century or so of computer programming is often forgotten, um, at least until recently, it's been, it's been pretty much swept under the rug. There have been a lot of initiatives um, lately, like the Ada Initiative, um, which have done a lot to restore women to their place in the history of computer programming. There are also structures of technologism and technological determination, uh, sorry, determinism, that following marks any critique of capitalism has to deconstruct. And there are finally structures within our professions. In librarianship, there are structural relationships between libraries and vendors between hierarchical levels of administration, and between what I'll call neoliberal and progressive ideologies. These structures are challenged both by one's own learning and by the social networks that arise through the practice of learning. And I'm thinking of communities like Code Newbies, Critlib, and Mashcat, which are on, which are Twitter conversations, um, and Exorcism.io, which is a social networking site for um, programming practice. but also through informal teaching. Um, I think these structures are challenged also through informal teaching. Sharing information through hackfests, through unconferences and institutes like this, through pair programming, as well as through the formal practice of teaching. Uh, in, in librarianship, uh, teaching tends to be concentrated either in information literacy, se literacy sessions um, or in library and information science programs. In this respect, then, coding, the actual act of computer programming, becomes a bit of a MacGuffin. The semantic content is unimportant. What is important is the activities and relationships that arise through the process of learning and acting, no matter what the object is. Coding, however, is low barrier and has developed pedagogical tools, systems, and networks over the last few years, which Unix system administration, for example, has not. You could say that, in essence, I think librarians should learn to code because ladies learning code exists. In conclusion, I think it's safe to say that learning code can't happen in isolation. It has to be a social activity. It has to compete in some sense with what Marx calls the nexus between man and man that is naked self-interest. There are many other skills that humanists could adopt. There are many other arenas in which capitalist technology might be challenged. There are many other methods by which a critical pedagogy might be adopted, but learning to code seems to me at least at this historical moment to lie at the intersection of all of these considerations. I think um, thinking about what the way Grimm was speaking to the software engineers, uh, you're right. Um, agile methodologies, I think, come out of software engineering and um, frustrations with software engineering. Um, I think probably there, there would be a lot of interesting stuff that you could take out of literate programming. Um, I haven't heard it talked about in, in software development circles in a while, and I wonder if that just means it's sort of ripe for a rediscovery. You know, and, and that's probably something that I should look into. Because um, we have an old copy at Canon, so take a look. I, I don't know if it's being talked about or used in the way that Knuth talked about it. No. He, right. he was reacting to sort of procedural programming. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that he said that I, resonates with me is that programming is about communicating with humans, mm -hmm. and you, you should start with a communicative act, and then you add the code layer. Yeah, and from, from what I understand from West's book, um, object-oriented 
development, object-oriented design, came out of that same frustration with procedural programming. Um, and the early proponents of OO also talked about that, um, that sort of focus on communicating with other people. But somewhere along the line, that, that seems to have been lost, um, which might have been the point of Grimm's, of Grimm's talk, that there are a lot of people who talk about using OO but forget that you're meant to be dealing with other people. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, here. Thanks so much for that talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm, I'm with you on a, on a lot of points, but I just wanted to kind of raise the possibility that some of the qualities that you cite as kind of liberatory or uh, resistant um, might, from some people's perspective, be seen as exactly the kind of oppressive mechanisms that um, the, that symptomize neoliberalism. So, mm -hmm. like, informality is great and fun unless you are, for example, a, a person of color or a woman or a woman who is a person of color um, who, who suddenly doesn't have mechanisms to, to advance in a hierarchy, for sure. example. Mm -hmm. um, Transparency is wonderful unless you're one of those people who is engaging in controversial scholarship and doesn't necessarily want it circulating sure. among like the NRA or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I think that's absolutely that you're absolutely spot on with that. Um, and I I maybe maybe didn't make it as, as clear as I could have. I, I think that that is a huge danger. But it's a huge danger with picking any methodology over, over another or privileging any one, one thing over another. Um, and I don't know that there's a solution to that. Certainly the stuff that, that I've been reading lately, um, no, no, everything seems to be very situational, right? It, that there is no answer that will apply across the board. Um, and what I would hope is that the flexibility um, that we might be able to gain from some of these methodologies would allow us to abandon them if necessary, right? So in situations where, as you say, informality or transparency are not the right call, that we would be able to do something else. But, but I, I, don't think there's an, I don't think there's an alternative to sort of trying to remain aware and trying to um, make decisions in the moment as best you can kind of thing, and constantly be reflecting on the thing you just raised, yeah. yeah. I just want to add an interpretive dimension um, from my own um, background, um, which um, uh, had been in the arts and, and um, uh, phenomenology in the arts and crafts movement. And um, so to me, I'm, I'm reading a lot of relationships with, with the, the, the building of autonomy and rebuilding a relation, an in in intimate relationship with, with one's own work, especially when you're talking about librarians making these own decisions and bypassing middlemen in the administration, but also um, how that embodiment um, can also then connect to, uh, to uh, like a, a reinvigoration of the social body. Mm -hmm. And that's just an interpretation that I kind of just want to open up because that's um, that's what I've been uh, reading into some of the more theoretical dimensions of this. Marcus and... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not having a revolution anytime soon. <laughs> um, and what I would hope would come out of some of these practices is exactly that, is, is as, as Jeffrey pointed out, writing software is not the point communicating with other people is. Um, finding a way where you can have social relationships and perhaps reinvigorating a concept of society that that the status quo would, would like to repress. Um, if that's a possibility, and it's not a simple, straightforward possibility, um, and it's fraught with dangers, but if that's a possibility, I think that would be a benefit. Yeah. Um, Um, significant will have possibly their greatest utility in, in amateurism. 
Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that most people that I know, and I'm more familiar with the Toronto branch than the Edmonton branch, okay. um, most people that I know who take ladies learning code or code boot camps are doing so because they see these um, these organizations as giving them a kind of knowledge that will help them to advance in their careers. Yes. So it's very explicitly not amateur, and some of the boot camps actually have uh, launched a couple of, mm -hmm. of front end working careers that I know. So seeing as these people that I know who are participating in ladies learning code and boot camps are women, mm -hmm. um, and if we're going to imbue sort of your arts criticism with a bit of feminist criticism, mm -hmm. like is 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 feminism different for women? Is it like especially when we're we're accessing these sort of playful, informal mm -hmm. um, resources as a means to an end mm -hmm. in getting out? I think, um, I didn't mean to suggest that the outcome for anyone who attends Ladies Learning Code was an amateur outcome and not useful in a professional sense. Um, I think of Ladies Learning Code and Software Carpentry and other organizations like that as able to much more quickly make decisions, much more quickly able to um, adapt to what their constituents require. Um, and able to sort of put on events very quickly and easily. And it's, it's that, that informality around the organizations themselves, or what I see as informality around the organizations themselves, that I think is a positive. Um, compared, for example, to corporate training, right? Where things have to be planned out months in advance. They can be multi-week things. They require a lot of planning, a lot of scheduling. Um, and so the, the, the training program itself is heavily formalized and heavily over-engineered, over -engineered, as opposed to things like um, my experience with Ladies Learning Code in Edmonton, software carpentry, um, new things like unconferences and that camps, which um, don't require a kind of formality around organizing. Um, the outcomes can be whatever anyone can, can make of them. Um, as to whether amateurism and is different for women than for men, um, I, I recognize that, that Historically, that's that's been a really um, that that's been used to, to keep women in a certain area, right? Um, and I don't know. I mean, that that's obviously a danger with it, right? Is that um, if someone takes a ladies learning takes a series of ladies learning code events, um, but doesn't take a heavily formalized engineering engineered corporate training thing. Um, is that considered less valuable educational? You know, um, I think it will be used that way. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a way to fight that unless we who are, if we're ever in hiring positions, are able to recognize that that's, that that's valid. Um, but again, I think it goes back to the point I raised with Miriam that it, we have to constantly be aware that that's a danger um, and constantly react in the moment according to what we think is best. So, um, this one last thing is that I would really sincerely like to thank everybody who attended the conference um, like so far, and where I'm really looking forward to the day at Ryerson tomorrow, which I think will be a little bit different from what's been happening here at UTSC, because there's lots of tours planned, there's lots of uh, round tables and discussions, so I think it's going to be a really good and um, sort of a, a nice uh, nice um, opportunity to have more conversations rather than just uh, coming to sessions. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. And again, I wanted to say that the registration is at the Peter Bronfman House, or yeah, the Peter Bronfman Center, I'm sorry, I keep uh, marking that up, at East Slip House. And again, that's uh, 297 Victoria Street. Nearest um, TTC station is Dundas Station. And um, there have been a, a couple of changes on the website, so please make sure to visit the website to get any information that you might need. Um, and also, um, just to show fans of who's taking the shuttle home, there is a shuttle at 5 p.m. Okay, so you can just make your way over to 
Yes, yeah, 5, 5 30. Yes, it is 5 p.m. now. So, <laughs> um, sorry about that. So, um, when you basically, obviously, the drop off point is where the pickup point is. So, if you want to make your way over to the pickup point, um, you can catch the shuttle at 5 30. Okay? Um, and thank you very much. And uh, looking forward very much to tomorrow as well at Ryerson. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you.